Hey there, Dango Stu here. Today's video is about the tools you need for working on outboards and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. I've got some videos planned for the coming weeks on ignition systems, that kind of stuff, so particularly to do with spark plugs and HT leads. For today though, I thought I'd just keep it a bit of fun. It's late, it's Friday, it's beer o'clock. Obviously there's a bit of a base level of tools you're going to need to work on just about anything. You know, your spanners, your screwdrivers, that kind of thing. I'll go through and roughly show you what I keep in each toolbox anyway, but I'll try to focus on things that are specifically for outboards. If you're predominantly working just on your own outboard, then you're pretty lucky. You can kind of get just one service manual and one type of each specialist tool you need and you're kind of good to go. Unfortunately, if you're working on lots of different types of outboards, it gets pretty hard to have everything you need because there's just so many brands, so many tools tools that only work for a particular range of horsepower and it blows out of proportion pretty fast. So I'll show you the essentials I use regularly though. I don't have one of everything from all the different manufacturers. They're a little bit pricey. They're actually quite hard to get. A lot of dealers won't even sell you tools that are specific unless you are a dealer of that brand. It all gets a bit sort of political. Anyway, that's enough yakking. I'll go through each of the boxes and I'll just show you the main things that I think are important in those boxes if you're working on outboards. So more or less I give them all a bit of a theme. The one on the right is tools that have something to do with motors. So they're specifically tools that you only need if you're working on a motor, so they're not general things like spanners or whatever. So first one's timing light. Obviously timing's really important with any motor you're working on. Not all outboards are set with a timing light, but plenty are, so they're well worth having. Pretty quickly though, that also brings me to one of the most important tools you can ever have, and that's the service manual. Straight away, you can't do your timing unless you know what the specs are for the timing. So whether it's telling you how many degrees before and after top dead center, or whether it's giving you the lengths for linkages, you're gonna need that manual to get the specs you need to set it right. Uh, this is a dwell meter, which we tend to use more with old cars. Probably are some old outboards out there that have points, but not something I ever deal with. Ah. Stethoscope. Mechanic stethoscopes are really handy for locating noises, so highly recommend these. They're not very expensive. If a tool's particularly expensive, I'll, I'll point out that, look, it's maybe not realistic to own on privately, but tools like this are like $20, and they can really help you locate a weird noise, whether it's coming from a particular part of the power head, gearbox, whatever, so very handy thing too. This style of ring compressor is disliked by a lot of people. They're very sharp, they're sort of a bit razor blade-ish. But the great thing is they work for quite a range of ring sizes. You can get fancier ones where you need to have specific sizes, but as a bit of a cheap work on most motors, this style's pretty cost effective. This is my little remote starter that I did a video on a while ago. It's really, really handy when you're working by yourself at the back of the boat, checking spark and all that kind of thing. I'm actually thinking of doing a video one day of making an upgraded panel with a bit of an ignition switch and a whole lot of stuff. But for now, I find this does the trick for starting or at least cranking the motor from the back of the boat. Various styles of oil filter removal tool are pretty cool to have. Uh, I've got this one, uh, sort of a pliery type thing. Ones, this is specific to a Toyota. Various types. You get these uh, band types as well. Another thing I use commonly in conjunction with that remote starter is a little spark tester like this. And I find these really good for testing the coils, essentially testing a whole ignition system right to the where the plug would be. Then naturally flowing on from there is spark plug sockets. I've actually got some thinner walled ones that I use for outboards because a lot of outboards, particularly four strokes, have really tightly recessed spark plugs. So having thin wall ones really helps you get those out. Paste and suction caps for lapping valves. Oh, and in here, I'll show you. In here I've got some old spark plugs I've been saving that um, have all sort of failed in some curious way that I'll be using for that spark plug video down the track. Uh, in here is the feeler gauges for setting valve clearances and that kind of thing. Really, really handy things to have. This is actually a really handy tool too. This is a little gauge for checking what pitch the thread is on a bolt. Ah, this is another style of oil filter remover that I really like. I found this one to work really well. It's a, a snap-on one made in the US, but I've actually found this to be a really, really good one. These I really like too, which are for cutting hose square. It's a little bit of a luxury thing, but they've actually been really good. 
I think I used those in the video on um, doing the hydraulic steering installation. Uh, compression tester is a really good thing to have. Really good for both just diagnosing a fault with a motor and just monitoring its health as you service it. This is a set of wad punches for cutting the holes in a gasket. I've got that video on making a paper gasket, so that's really handy for making your own. So that box is all the stuff sort of for working specific on motors. This particular box is welding and metalwork kind of stuff. So I keep in this, uh, you know, tungsten, collets, all that kind of stuff for tigging and plasma cutting, and uh, some brazing rods and things and some stick welding rods and that kind of stuff. In this box I also keep a little set of these sort of files for unblocking the nozzle on an oxy torch, that kind of thing. So anything particularly related to metal work I keep in this box, but it's not particularly outboard stuff. The one thing I do keep in here that I use a lot generally is a little set of digital vernier calipers. They're really handy too for just taking all sorts of measurements. Really accurate, really easy to use, and once again, not ridiculously expensive. Ah, uh, there's not much else that's interesting in there. Next one is electrical. One of my favorite things from the electrical box is this Autoprobe style thing. I think Autoprobe is actually a brand name, so this is a multi-function auto tester, a cheaper version of the same thing. You hook it up to the battery, you can then touch the single probe to any point, see whether it's got voltage there or whether it's got a ground and then you can use this button to supply voltage or supply ground. So it's really good for doing quick diagnosis. Essentially the same as a multimeter, although a multimeter can't supply current, so it's, I think it's better for testing because it can supply current as well. And I find them a bit easier to use. It doesn't do everything a multimeter does, but it's certainly my first go-to tool if I'm diagnosing an electrical fault. Then, going simpler again, is just a standard test light. Give it an earth. If you've got current, the light comes on. So the other thing is just a traditional digital multimeter. They're great in that you can do every test, your resistance tests, all that kind of stuff. They're a little bit more fiddly. I'd go to the Autoprobe first, but the Autoprobe has its limits and that's why you kind of need to have a multimeter too. Box is a heat shrink tubing, really handy. And then I've also just got some liquid electrical tape that I quite like in certain circumstances. Normal electrical tape in this one, uh, various Scraps of smaller rolls of wire I keep in the middle drawer. And so various types of solder, a little gas soldering iron, flux pens, a little bit of stuff for removing solder. This stuff's actually really cool. This is a, a little sort of paste that you put your soldering iron through for reconditioning the tip of the soldering iron. And it works really well, I like this stuff. Uh, this one's kind of electrical tools, like hand tools to do with electrical work. The ones I use by far the most are a set of wire strippers like this, which are great. They just grab the wire, strip it, doesn't matter the size, it sort of auto detects it all somehow. And then a set of these crimpers. So these two I definitely say are the two common sort of wire stripping, crimping hand tools I use for electrical work. Then obviously there's a range of screwdrivers and whatever that are more specific to electrical work as well. Yeah, the rest of that's pretty boring. That one's camera stuff for filming. Don't know why it's there. And then here, I'll show you it's gonna be easier. Essentially just crimp connectors, some heat shrink ones, sort of spade connectors, ring terminals, heat shrink connectors, spare relays and stuff, bullet connectors, all that kind of stuff. And soldering iron, obviously, to go with the other soldering stuff. Under the bench is a bit of a mess, but I'll have a sticky beak and see if there's any highlights. Leak down tester, yeah, kind of handy from time to time. Similar league as a compression tester, but you don't need the motor to be turning to do it, so it can be good for just blocks that aren't actually currently, you know, in a serviceable state. There's a few uses for it, but to be honest with you, I use the compression tester much more than the leak down tester. Here's some tubs of just leftover bolts. These are all the metric ones, these are the interior ones. Set of hole saws there for doing some dash work and that kind of thing, putting in stern lights. So they're pretty handy for those jobs. This is something I actually use quite a lot, which is the heat gum. 
I use it pretty much all the time when I'm doing heat shrink tape or low temperature solder, that kind of stuff, because it shrinks it without burning it at all. So heat guns are really handy for that sort of stuff. Uh, actually, now we've gone down, I'll quickly show you up. Uh, up here is the carb sink tool, which there's another video on that, and they're actually pretty handy when you're doing multi carburetor outboards. Here's a bit of an array of things I've pulled off outboards and thought were worth keeping, you know, old carburetors, trim tilts, some pull start stuff, more pull start. Up on top here, I've just got some boxes. It's smaller parts, so, you know, Yamaha, Mercury, Honda, Tatsu, whatever. And uh, it just, uh, just gives me somewhere to throw bits that I might need one day. Little outboard stands are great, ones you can wheel around. I've got that bigger one, I think it's my very first video, was making the timber outboard stand. So they're really handy. More recent video I did was on making the lower unit stand. So those are something I use heaps now. A crane like this is really handy if you need to take outboards on and off a boat. That could be if you're changing the tilt tube, you're swapping it out, you're doing work to the transom, whatever. Once again, not particularly cheap, not something you'll need that often, but when you need to do the job, maybe hiring is the option because they really do make it easy and much safer. On the side of this toolbox, I've just got a standard set of sprays I use a lot, so I guess you'd consider that a tool really. A few lubricants. Can of start, you bastard. You always need that. Another grease. This grease I actually use there's lots of them around. This particular one is uh, white lithium grease that I use on steering cables, so that's a common one. Carb cleaner, obviously need that quite a lot. Yeah, and brake cleaner is the other one I use a fair bit of. So I think brake cleaner, a couple of good lubricants and carb cleaner, and that kind of covers the sprays. On the top of the bench where I can just get to it easily all day, I keep the really common things. So some bull nose pliers, needle nose pliers, and diagonal cutters or side cutters. So that's a really common one. A set of reasonably mid-sized flathead and Phillips head screwdrivers. These are just a set of T-bars that are pretty handy. So I think it's an 8, 10, 12, and 14 millimeter T-bar. So they end up being a bit of a go-to as well. Saves you rigging up a ratchet or anything. This I find handy because it's a little bit flexible and this is the socket size. It's just a little hex socket. I think it's a seven mil or something, which is the size that all our hose clamps are. So it essentially just sits with the hose clamps and it's great for getting those on and off. After that, just a variety of different ratchets, some you know swivel heads, some straight. So this is a three eighth and a quarter inch one and then just a larger three eighth one. Also then just have a couple of extensions so a 3 eighths extension and a quarter inch extension. So they're things that I find I just use so often that I don't even bother putting them away. They just live on the top of the box. These don't have a place, but there's always heaps of them lying around with just little brass brushes or stainless steel brushes. Really handy. An enormous part of doing mechanical work is actually just cleaning something. It's stopped working because it's got dirty, it's got corroded, whatever. So cleaning tools are a surprising part of the whole kind of ensemble. Top drawer after that is just spanners and sockets. I tend to use a lot of deep sockets. I also keep just smaller spanners in here. These only go up to about 20 mil, but for doing a lot of outboard stuff like collars on trim tilts or tilt tubes, you need up to about 32 mil for those. Second drawer starts to get a little bit random. A set of chisels and punches, this kind of thing, really handy. Then I've got some Torx bits, which you'll need for various motors. These are just a set of uh, Allen keys which uh, go onto the ratchet, so it's either 3 8 or a quarter inch depending on the size of the Allen key. I have no idea what's in there, but there's a bit of a bore brush as well that you can use for cleaning out tilt tubes. See, I can use making this video as an opportunity to go and get everything more organised. This has just got some half inch sockets which obviously are pretty handy, although I find most half inch stuff I use is usually with the impact gun, so these actually don't get a lot of use. If I'm using a hand tool, I tend to use a 3 8 And if I'm using half inch, it tends to either be sort of a breaker bar with an impact socket or a impact socket on the gun. Little set of uh, ratchet spanners. I don't use anywhere near as much as you might think. I just, I don't know. I find them more trouble than they're worth most of the time. Uh, fourth drawer. This is like that drawer everyone has in their kitchen, which is everything doesn't have a place. 
It's also stuff I don't use very often. It's really the stuff that's too good to throw away, might need it one day, but not really. A few things to note in it though. I think this is actually the from a MIG gun, I think, I'm not sure. But it's flexible and it's quite strong and it's really good for feeding through, attaching a wire to and pulling a wire through. So it's kind of a bit of a, an electrical thing if you just want to start running wires and you need some way of getting a wire through a long, tight space. So I keep that for that. But this thing's handy too, which is just the little, uh, you know, come out and grab something. Magnets are good, but aluminium parts, all that kind of stuff, stainless parts aren't magnetic. So one of these is kind of handy as well if you need to get something you've dropped. There's a few more sort of, you know, Allen key sets and things in there, but I tend to use those ratchet ones wherever I can. So the next drawer is actually the output specific stuff. This is the drawer really I probably should have made this video about, but given I'm always sitting at the workbench and you know, you may have been wondering what's in those boxes and now you know it's not interesting. So in no particular order, this is the gearbox pressure testing tool that we put in last video or video before, whatever. So really, really handy. Pretty much every service I'd be using this tool once I'd trained the gearbox oil to check whether there's a problem with the seals. This is just a little packet of the fiber washers to put onto the drain plugs and the fill plugs of the gearbox. Some outboards have O-rings, some have fiber washers. Once again, if you're just working on your own outboard, great. You can find out what size you need, what type it is, and that's all you need to stock. This is a really good thing to have, regardless of the brand of your outboard, if you've had trouble with the magnets under the flywheel. It's basically an epoxy for attaching the magnets to the inside of the flywheel. I had an outboard recently where it came off, so I bought this kit. And, oh, here's a number for you, if you're interested. There we go, that's an Evernode number. And it came with a couple of sachets. I used one sachet to fix that outboard, and I'll just keep this for next time. Ah, first custom tool. So this tool, in all its glory, nothing much to it. But what I use this for is some starter motors have four brushes and springs pointing straight up. So I use this to hold those brushes down. It gives me the gap in the middle so the spindle of the starter motor can come down. You get it all together and then you can sort of slide it out and bolt it up. So I use this for reassembling that particular style of starter motor. For corroded tilt tubes, I use this sort of brake hone, dingle wall hone style for cleaning those out. Really effective if it's got heavy corrosion in it. Uh, and then once again, depending on your style of outboard, locking tabs for putting prop nuts on. So I've got some of that size and then some of these at this size. So worth having those if your outboard doesn't use a split pin. I think it's also worth having at least one small sort of easy to use tube of marine grease from pretty much any manufacturer. This is the sort of the one I use for the splines and drive shafts, prop shafts, that sort of stuff. Then obviously I've got other grease in a grease gun for doing the, you know, the zerk fittings or whatever. But one good tube of sort of grease you can just get on your finger and dob on is worth having too. Oh, as I was saying before, sort of at the beginning, these are some spark plug tools that just are very thin walled ones. And these are actually a variety of ones. I'm trying to think who made them. This one's got MP on it. I can't recall, to be honest with you. Oh, they both are MP's Motion Pro. That's where I got these. I think they're actually from a motorcycle store. I've got a few pullers and things in the bigger drawers below, but one of the things you need with a puller is a hook to grab whatever it is you're trying to pull out. These particular ones were Yamaha ones. This is actually just a gal bolt that I heated, bent, and then shaved the side so it can fit in. So you can kind of make your own of those. This little one's actually it's like I used in the video on putting the Y fish in. It's a little anti-foul just designed for transducers. This, as far as I can tell, is Vaseline. It's just used for putting the needles in the con rods that we did for rebuilding the effing route. Dielectric grease kind of either goes here or in the electrical stuff, but it's uh, grease that's sort of non-conductive, so you can put it in your electrical fittings and it won't sort of arc between it, but it keeps the water out of the electrical fitting. So it's kind of handy stuff too. Then I've got a variety of these sort of face spanners. They're just two points like this or this or this style for doing things like taking the caps off the trim tilt units, that sort of thing. Doesn't matter how many of these I have, I still can't get them to fit most of them. Often you do need the one that the manufacturer sells. Be careful with these two because those caps can get really stuck. 
this particular one bit on pretty badly once when that pin broke on it. It's actually the thinner side of it. And of course you're putting a lot of force when it breaks and then ended up tearing your shoulder sort of thing. So they're a little bit of a fiddly tool and often I find you have limited success with them. With the one that Arn uh, got a bit injured using, we ended up actually air chiseling it, like drifting it round and replacing it. The new caps were like 30 bucks or something and they were so stuck that there was just no other way. They were damaged by the time we got them out, chuck them away, put new caps in. If your output's quite new, you might have luck with a tool like that, but by the time it's 20, 30 years old, it's a bit hit and miss. These kind of things can be handy. They're splined like this and like this, and then they've got a hex on it. So you can use it to hold a drive shaft, put it on a drive shaft and hold it and rotate it. Once again, unfortunately, I've never seen anyone that sells a full set of these, and it doesn't matter how many you've got, you've never got the one you need. Some outboards don't have lifting points on them. I can't remember what it is. It was a Johnson, Mercury, something like that. And you screw in a lift on it. So this was actually just a tool that goes into the thread there and then lets you lift the outboard power head off. Now I think about it, I think this bit actually threads into the top of the outboard and then this eye went into that as a lifting point. Circlet pliers are pretty handy in a similar vein to the tool I was talking about for taking the caps off trim tilt units, but just for doing the little circlips. Uh, these are pretty handy. On a lot of outboards, you'll see they've got those sort of wire, particularly Yamaha I think has them, those wire hose clamps on the fuel lines. It's basically just a bit of wire that goes and turns. And if you use a standard set of pliers, instead of coming together, they just sort of come and they spread apart and they drive your spare. These pliers have just got a little opening in the very tip of them and same on the side. And they're essentially just for undoing those clamps. So this is the style of hose clamp I'm talking about that I use those pliers for. This is just a gearbox seal, like a prop shaft seal, that kind of thing. That sort of thing I think is well worth having in the spares for your outboard. And if you've got old drive shafts, old gear selector rods, that kind of stuff, they're well worth keeping too because you can make little tools out of them. Drive shafts make excellent punches, so I always keep them just as big, strong punches. But in this case, I made this one, which was the drive shaft from Yamaha. So it goes up into the crankshaft, and then I just filed the ends flat. And it gave me a way to put it up into the crankshaft, hold it still while I was undoing a flywheel nut, or rotate the mate, or whatever I need to do. So it's worth making something like that. It doesn't take a lot of space, and if you've already got the drive shaft, you know, it costs you nothing to make. Here's just a selection of uh, stainless steel nylocks for on the end of drag links for steering and some stainless steel split pins for putting your prop nuts back on as well. This is one of the few actual sort of OEM tools that I've got. And this is one for just getting in and holding the nut on the end of the pinion gear for the drive shaft. And it comes with a few different size sockets and it's spring loaded, so it just pushes up against it for removing drive shafts. Uh, this little loom I made up because a lot of trim tilt units have a round plug, you pull it apart, and it's just two female spade connectors inside the plug that goes down to the trim tilt motor. So I just made up a little wire, just, I should put some alligator clips, but at the moment it's just bare wire, and then just a couple of cut back spade connectors so I can put it into the connector and just supply power straight to the trim tilt motor, so it's really good for testing. This is just a little set of vice grips that I've just put some fuel line on the end of, so you can crimp off fuel lines, stop fuel running out, but you don't damage it. As Eric the car guy once said, nothing ever goes wrong when you have hose on hose. I've also got a variety of O-rings I keep, which are thinner ones for like the backs of carburetors and that kind of thing. But once again, it's really hard to keep all the types you need. Sometimes you are better off just ordering it when you need it. This is just a little hand drill. So drill bits just go in a little hand collet. That's really good for clearing out the little PO tube on the front of the gearbox that your Speedo drives from. So that's worth doing each service too. This is just a little bit of aluminium anti-seize. I don't use it a lot, but it's nice to have an anti-seize like this that you know is compatible with aluminium, unlike a copper based one or something. Another custom tool I made was quite a large socket here. I can't remember what size it was now. I probably can't read it because I painted it. But 
essentially it was a large socket and then I cut it in half. You can see the cuts are here and here and then welded in a bit of steel tube here. The reason I did that is because this has to then go down over the top of a crankshaft to get the nut at the bottom of it. So it's the nut at the top of the crankshaft under the flywheel, but because you've got the crankshaft coming up, you need quite a long socket and it's also quite large, not something you could really buy. I think you can buy it as a custom tool from Yamaha or whatever, but it was cheaper just to get a generic socket, cut it and extend it. Because the outboards always have lots of corrosion and impact screwdrivers really handy, I'm gonna do a video on corrosion down the track soon and I'll go through how you use those during that video. Bigger vice grips are really handy too. Seized bolts, a million and one uses. A relatively small ratchet strap I use to support the gearbox while you're reinstalling it. There's a little video on that, but well worth keeping a little one of these. Uh, long angled pliers I find really useful too. They were in the wrong drawer, but they're great. They actually live on the top. That's how often I use them. They're one of those things that's a real go-to tool for me. Large multi-grips too. Good for just undoing things, larger things, caps, even just stuck oil caps, that kind of stuff. Very handy. A set of different length pry bars are really handy too. The number of things you have to pry off is, is huge, so well worth having a set of pry bars. There's also just a whole set of pullers, various sort of pulley pullers. Then there's ones for pulling flywheels off, spigot bearing pullers, all sorts of things. So a good set of pullers for all different situations is yeah, pretty much essential. This is actually sold as a propeller puller, so it's for getting propellers that are stuck onto the prop shaft. This is actually another style of bearing carrier puller that I actually really like. The prop shaft sort of captivated inside here so it can't go flopping around. And the idea is it goes in and you can see the teeth like so you go in and you rotate it till it locks in and then you crank it. I'd actually really like to look at making some of these but for smaller outboards. I think it's a really good design but I've only ever seen it for much larger outboards. So I'd be keen to weld something up that works on smaller outboards. And uh, so if I do that, I'll do a video on making that as well. It looks pretty straightforward. Really, it's a bit of pipe. These pieces are welded on, a nut's welded on there, then a large bolt. So it shouldn't be too hard to copy it. This is the style of puller that I use with those hooks I showed earlier for pulling bearing carriers out. This is the little custom made up tool I use for oiling the control cables. There's a video on that. And then this one here is a larger one. This actually goes onto this end, and then this is for doing steering cables. You also must, must, must have lots of big hammers for hitting things. Well, that's kind of the highlights for the hand tools, certainly the things that I commonly use when I'm working on boats. The more you look around, the more you think, you know, there's a million and one things you do need. Heat's really important, like some sort of torch to put heat onto things, and things like the wire wheel there, things like a drill press as well, I guess it depends also how much fabrication and things like that you're going to be doing as well, but it goes on and on, so it won't bore you too much. I think if you're just doing your own basic servicing, then you obviously need a bit of a subset of these things. If you really want to just start building a bit of a collection and really working on your own cars, bikes, boats, whatever, then these are the things I find I commonly use. All right, well, I'll wrap this one up here. Thanks for watching. I hope it's sort of interesting just to see the sorts of things, particularly if you watch for a while and wondering what's inside all these different boxes. I know it probably seems like a bit of a filler video in some ways, but I did want to show you this stuff, and I do have some other videos planned coming up soon. I'm going to do those ignition ones, the, the HT leads the spark plugs. Also going to do some more work to the green machine. I'm going to find a leak, which I think is an interesting job to do. I'm also going to put some dual batteries and a solar cell, that kind of stuff. So that'll be the next videos coming up. Ah, I also ordered a hydrofoil for the green machine. So we'll do some before and after testing with that as well when I do that install. All right, well, take care and I'll catch you soon. See ya.